This is our second try at a recording with Homer Dangler. We're at the CLA show. Good morning, Homer. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to ask you a little bit about how you got started building rifles. Okay. I just got interested in them when I was a young fellow. My dad took me to a museum in Defiance, Ohio, where uh, they had some old guns from the Revolutionary Period and various periods. I thought all guns like this was in museums, fine collections around the country. But I found they were available to the countryside, a few pretty nice guns, yet so I started collecting. And in 1955, I built my first Kentucky rifle, and I've been building them ever since. For 20 years, it was a hobby. In 75, I started full-time building guns, and I've had orders continuously through that time, which kept me pretty busy. Did you? Now I'm kind of slowing down, semi-retiring, trying to, but I'm still interested <laughs> in building. I still build two or three guns a year. Okay. Uh, when did you first go to Friendship, to the Nationals? 1955, okay. or 1957. 1957 okay. was my first trip to Friendship. Okay. Uh, I've seems like I, every time I go past your booth at Friendship, there's uh, there's always something to see and look at. Yeah, over the years, I've made a lot of friends, and of course, my wife got involved in it when I went full time, and, and she's met a lot of friends, and the two of us really enjoy going to Friendship to the National Most Loading Range, and man, the booth. Okay. And all of our friends stop by, and uh, it's really quite an experience. I often, or I almost always, see her with you at Friendship, anyway. Yes. Um, if you had a favorite rifle style or school you like to build, what would that be? J.P. Beck, I feel, was one of the finest builders of the early guns. His art style and execution of the carving and engraving with a very light touch was very good, and they hold beautifully. I probably made more J.P. Beck style rifles, and I have all other ones put together, but I've made various different schools and areas of gun building. Um, how about um, uh, pistols or fouling pieces? Uh, I've made a few followers, and there's some very nice followers to be made. There's some very nice ones out there, originals, and I duplicate original guns to the very letter. Uh, having a few nice guns, I have them on my workbench when I'm building them. And uh, I don't like to do my own style on any particular thing. I have built uh, three rifles of a similar style that I developed, but uh, and they're nice, but I really like to follow the originals completely. And uh, I have done a few pistols over the years, although a pistol takes about three-fourths the time to build as a rifle, uh -huh. and to get three-fourths the amount of money out of it is uh, a little bit harder to do. More people are interested in rifles, <coughs> and the same way with the old original Kentucky pistols, they are very rare. Not very many were made compared to the number of rifles okay. that were made, so I'm sure they were very expensive compared to a rifle even at that day. You would not have expected a, a, a pistol in the hands of the common man then because of cost? Very seldom. Okay. Very seldom. Um, tell me about parts for your rifles. Do you have special uh, uh, locks that you like better than others or trigger sets? Or? Well, yes. I like um, locks that are uh, compatible with the gun. And uh, the Siler lock was developed by Bud Siler back in... Uh, late 50s or early 60s, I believe, and it is a very close copy of what you find on most of the early original Kentucky rifles, or I like to call them American Long Rifle, mm -hmm. and um, that business has been sold, but retired, and Jim Chambers has the business now, and he continues to make the locks, and he's added a few other styles along with it. If I make a little later period lock, then I will use something like the L and R lock, something of that sort, for a period of a gun that's in the 1820s to mm -hmm. 1830s. 
a typical different style. Okay. For the slider is a hand forged style that was made here and also made in shops in Germany and picked up and sold here in this country. Okay. Uh, I know you're a man of wide interest. I, would you care to tell us about some of your other hobbies, like airplanes or? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I learned to fly in 1948. The government taught me to fly. And uh, I, after World War II, I learned to fly on the GI training program. And then after I got married and had a family, I didn't have the time nor the money to stay with flying. And uh, I left it and got into guns, got to build into guns, and uh, really had a good time in that. It's been a good life. When I got back into flying then a few years ago, quite a number of years ago, and I have an old, nicely restored 1941 Aronska that I fly, and I've flown it from, from Michigan to Florida and back, and long trips like that, and west and north some. But um, I always wanted to build an airplane. So a number of years ago, I built a open cockpit double wing airplane. Flew it about three years and sold it. I built another one a few years back, um, a high wing, two place side by side. I flew it some, and uh, these are experimentals. Okay. And um, I just started recently building another one. I had never built a low wing, so I'm building a low wing airplane now. My wife says that I might have met my Waterloo on this one. <laughs> the plans are on, the blueprints are on sheets of paper two feet by three feet, and there's 110 pages. <laughs> Every individual part for the gun is made from scratch. Every individual part from the gun is on those 110 pages. Wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, now, I, I, the last time I talked to you on the phone, you were headed for the Wisconsin to the, uh, the big fly-in. Yeah. Uh, I assume that's a, you see all kinds of home builds in places like that. Yeah. yeah that's Oshkosh, Wisconsin, the big fly-in up there. And um, I, went, I went to that and enjoyed several days. And... Uh, I don't stay for the whole week, but I stay for usually three or four days. Okay. Well, I have I, a good time. I, when I, and I fly into various other fly-ins around the country. Cool. I, I thought we ought to talk a little bit about airplanes just because it's a, an interest of yours. <laughs> it was my first love. Okay. Well, I, uh, the, the business of building things is in your blood, I can tell. Uh, but you're also a shooter. Uh, yeah. I like to shoot. A lot of builders shoot, but an awful lot of them don't. Uh, and I have always been, I was first a shooter, and then I wanted a good gun, uh -huh. so I started building. But uh, I still shoot, and uh, I have targets at home that I have shot that some pretty, pretty, pretty good scores. And uh, one that I shot about three years ago, I was 79 years old. 79 in several months, and I shot at 35 yards. I shot a 49 and three axes on a target. <laughs> That's amazing. So I still enjoy oh, shooting, yeah. and I still seem to be able to shoot pretty well. Okay. Uh, I used to shoot a lot of turkey shoots. My 70th year, my 70th year of age was the first year that I missed getting my live turkey in the head. Okay. Uh, I remember looking through old muzzle blasts and seeing pictures of you, you know, back in the 50s and 60s. And in those pictures, you're, you're apparently you're shooting then in those pictures. Yes. Yeah. Like that's an interesting thing to, to be able to work at that for that a long a time or to have fun at a sport for that long a time. Um, as I interview, the, one of the things that always uh, gnaws at me is I'm afraid I forget to ask you something that maybe you'd like to talk about. Is there anything that, that I haven't have neglected to ask you that you'd like to mention as far as the shooting sports or rifle oh. making? Probably not much. Uh, I and uh, several other fellows started a group called the Flintlock Buckskin Rendezvous where we wear buckskin costume or clothing 
and shoot flintlock rifles and we meet in the woods uh, twice a year for a weekend. That's cool. And uh, this October we will have our 50th. Oh wow. On the 40th I built a gun. On the 40th I built a gun for uh, this organization and they award that each year uh, as a roving trophy and they bring it back then the next okay. year. And um, this will be the 50th anniversary of our organization and I still wear my buckskin. We go in the woods and have a really good time. Wow, that's amazing. And really enjoy it. It's just like stepping back into the 1700s. Oh yeah. So we really, really enjoy that. Oh, that's cool. How many guys are still involved in that? Pardon? How many guys are still involved in that? Uh, uh, when we started out, we had around, the first year I think we had around 15 or so, and then it got to be where we'd have 20, maybe 25 uh, members, and it got to be a good many members now, and I would say there must be 60 some members. Oh, I see. 60 or better. Okay. Some members. Yeah, it's growing then. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. It's still, it's still growing. And when I shoot at these rendezvous, my buckskins are older than most of the participants. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's cool, too. Um, I, uh, I'm, I didn't ask you, and I, sh I need to, I suppose, um, in looking at your table at CLA or looking at your, your stuff at Friendship, um, I, I see the guns that you make. But here at CLA, I also see uh, originals that you own. Yeah. Uh, some beautiful regions. Uh, Carrie yeah. mention anything about those? Well, <coughs> I've been an avid collector also, and uh, when it was a hobby, when I built a gun or whatever, a gun or two, I would try to put that money in some originals. And uh, so I built up a collection of original guns. Occasionally we had to buy clothing or a house payment or something when I sold a gun, but I tried to always buy something. Mm -hmm. So I've got guns at home, originals that I bought years ago for not very much money. And uh, then I traded and studied and traded up and bought a little better guns until I got into some fine relief and incised carved Kentucky rifles that are very rare. And I've always been very interested in those and studied them a lot. And uh, the biggest collector or the biggest collection of that type of gun was Joe Kendig Jr. And uh, in his book, he has 282 of his better quality, really parked Kentuckys. I visited Joe on two occasions, and then after he passed away, I visited his son in gun dealing. <laughs> And in the gun room, all the guns are in that book are in one room. Wow. Up on the third floor of his home uh -huh. in York, Pennsylvania. So it was really quite a thrill to know Joe and visit with him and, and talk guns and uh, deal with him a few yeah. times. That sounds fantastic. That was uh, that and the Kentucky Rifle Association we meet once, mm -hmm. once a year in Pennsylvania was really nice. Do your uh, your favorites among the originals uh, run parallel to the kind you like to make as well? Yes, the J.P. Beck, J.P. Beck rifle is my favorite. And uh, by having an original J.P. Beck, it, I, it can be duplicated exact, even the, inside the patch box, the springs, the catches, the depth mm -hmm. of the box, and all his engraving style. You have to be able to handle a gun to see all the carving details in a mm -hmm. gun like that. And I have a fine Nicholas buyer that is every bit as nice, and his work was exceptionally nice too. And I've had, I have some Virginia guns, Lehigh Valley guns, Bucks County guns, various different areas of mm -hmm. the gun building. And I have had a good many more and I've sold a number of guns in the last 10 years. Okay. Appreciate the time you spent with us, and uh, we will uh, put your, uh, your telephone number and various contact information on our website, uh, okay. along with the audio. We have uh, a number of pictures of Homer with the uh, 
the rifles that he makes both at Friendship and here at the CLA. Thanks again, Homer. It's really been fun. Thank you for the, the first interview. I've been